Hi, I'm Christina Applegate. And I'm Jamie Lynn Sigler. And this is Messy. The following message is brought to you by Novartis. Since partnering with Novartis, I have been thinking a lot about when I was first diagnosed with relapsing MS. To be honest, I was overwhelmed and in denial, and I didn't want to accept it. Eventually, I had to be real with myself, reflect on what was important, reframe how my diagnosis was impacting my life, and focus on how I was feeling. And I wish I'd started thinking about my needs sooner. It helped me get to a place of acceptance and find the right treatment choice for me. And I really hope others don't wait as long as I did. That's why I partnered with Novartis to create a three-step guide, hoping it can help people speak up and voice their needs. Get the guide at reframingms.com. Hello, everybody. Do we, do we introduce ourselves anymore? I think everybody knows us by now, right? I'm Jamie. I'm... Who are you today? I don't know, sweetheart. All right. Get back to us. How are you, Jamie? I, I'm wonderful because I'm really, really excited about our guest. She's an award-winning journalist, a New York Times bestselling author, a number one New York Times bestselling author, I should say. 15 years of co-anchor of NBC's Today Show. I, every morning of my life. I spent with this woman. She was also the first woman solo anchor of a network evening newscast. She is an example of strength, giving back, and also somebody who takes life's challenges, learns her lessons from them, and shares the message. And that's what we do here in this podcast. We are so thrilled to welcome the one and only Katie Couric. Oh my God. So exciting. <laughs> Hi, ladies. I'm so happy to see you both. I'm such a big fan of both of you. And I have to apologize to your listeners in advance because they can probably tell that I have a bad cold. So I apologize for my voice, which sounds like I got I'm talking <laughs> like that. We can all do You want us all to do it? <laughs> a great cartoon VO. Like yeah. maybe you should like audition for a voice. I'll call my right, agent, Christine, like right now and yeah. just be like, I can play that little weird bunny. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, though, you know, aside from that, when I don't have a cold that I was thinking I should do some voiceover work because my should. voice, I think because people listen to me for so many years, a lot of times I'll be out and about and I won't have any makeup on and I'll just, you know, be whatever. But when I start talking that's when people say, wait a second, because I think when people watch the Today Show, they actually were doing other things. So they mm-hmm. listened more than they watched. And so as a result, for a certain demographic, my voice is very recognizable. Well, yes. I mean, you're Katie Couric. That's yeah. the thing. Like, there's a lot of people we've had on here that we can't just be like, you're blah, blah, blah. It's like, you're Katie Couric. Like, that's yeah. it's its own poster of name. And I was going to say something about For me, when I would try to be incognito, my nose gave me away. Really? Everything else was like, I could hide it all. But if the the nose, my weird. um, No, you have a very. I love your nose. I I love your nose. I'm not trying to make it about me. I'm just saying it's so funny that there's certain (laughs) things about all of us that have that thing. My mom used to call that a a ski slope nose. Yes. Yes. You could jump right off of it and then also (laughs) see into my brain. Oh, yes. And she used to also call it a don't rain on me nose. (laughs) Oh, I get it now. Yeah. That's very cute. There you go. Well, we cold, no nasally voice or not, we are so thrilled to have you here with us because you have been somebody who, I mean, one of my first memories of somebody that's taken something deeply personal and tragic that's happened in their life and decide to share it publicly and heal publicly and have it turn into a purpose. And I think you were really ahead of your time when you did that. And I would love, I'm sure you've shared so much about that experience, but you know, what were the lessons and what were the things that you turned to that gave you the strength to do that as we sort of navigate the space right now ourselves? And can I post, can I post PS on that? So you can answer both. Being a woman in your field like 
I don't even know like how you broke that. You know, I hate to always say that the glass ceiling, because I think we've used that a lot, but it's this. Yeah. You broke it in and you are a legend. So, okay. So her question, then my question. There you go. Okay. That's how we do things. All right. Okay. So Jamie's question first, I think it's so interesting. The changes we've witnessed, the evolution in people's willingness to talk about things that were once taboo, Mm -hmm. you know, that were once too private, too personal, and somehow embarrassing. And I think that, you know, everybody has shit that happens to them in their lives. And, you know, I, I think diseases in particular need to need to be out in the open. So I really applaud both of you for doing this podcast. I'm sure you know, and your producer, Allison, who's also my friend, has told you how important it is and how important it is to build community. And I think since my husband was diagnosed and died of colorectal cancer in 1998, he was diagnosed in April of 1997, there really has been a shift in attitudes about people's willingness to talk about things. And I think, you know, you can say a lot of negative things about the internet and social media and our digital lives and how so much of what we should be doing has been taken over by a more virtual existence. Mm -hmm. But I think it has allowed people to form communities and to be heard and be seen and be helped by people who are in a similar situation. And, you know, I, I am just amazed almost on a daily basis, people coming forward and talking about things in a way that destigmatizes illness, in a way that brings attention to illnesses and diseases and a way that the the collective voices help demand more research into various diseases. You know, I, I just interviewed Francis Collins who ran the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, from 2009 till 2021. And he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He was part of a clinical trial. It became more aggressive. He had surgery. And, you know, he he wrote an article in the Washington Post about it. And I said to him, Francis, he lets me call him Francis. <laughs> He's go. like a geneticist. He, he, you know, mapped the human genome. He's a brainiac, uh, like unparalleled brainiac. But he said, you know, I just, whenever you can give people information and and do the things that I mentioned, form community, and in his case, you know, he wanted men to know that if they have elevated, that A, they should check their PSA, and if they have elevated PSAs, what that means. And I just think the world is, there's so much information and so much stuff out there that anytime we can use whatever our situations are to help people live healthier, happier lives, it's it's kind of, I think, imperative. And and I think for the three of us, we have platforms. You know, we are known individuals. Um, and I think it does have a lot of impact when someone shares a really intensely personal experience and is willing to come forward and talk about things. So I felt at the time, just to get back to your question, Jamie, sorry, I'm so long-winded, no. that the Today Show was such an incredible platform. You know, we had millions of people watching. This was before iPhones and yeah. the fragmentation of media. You know, it was kind of a destination for a lot of people because there were there were limited options, right? If you wanted to know what was going on in the world, you read your paper, you turned on NPR, your local radio, or you turned on a morning show, right? And I just felt, God, it would be criminal if there's ways to prevent this disease from happening to someone else. If there are ways to keep fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers and sons and daughters, et cetera, et cetera, alive, 
because you can get screened for something, I felt it was almost criminal not to take advantage of my platform. And that's why, you know, I, you know, looking back on it, it seems so natural. I had learned so much about colorectal cancer during my husband's illness. And I felt, I felt really obligated to share it with millions of people and tell them there are things you can do that mm-hmm. will prevent this disease, that will prevent a premature death that, you know, our daughters were six and two when Jay died and he was so ripped off. And I just, I thought if I can save one life, if I can get one person to get screened, if I can get one person to talk to their doctor, if I can get one person to be aware of symptoms like blood in your stools or unexplained weight loss or the whole panoply of reasons that that someone might have colorectal cancer, I mean, why wouldn't I? Yes. So I think I think it's it's really wonderful that now it's become much more sort of the status quo. I was just I don't know. I was scrolling Instagram and I saw someone, I don't know who she is, but I think she was filling in for Glennon Doyle on her podcast. And I think I gathered that she has breast cancer and she's talking about dense breasts. And I was diagnosed with dense, with breast cancer two years ago. And I've been, you know, talking till I'm blue in the face. We're sis, we're sisters in that respect. Yes, exactly. And I was, and, and I don't want to t- stop your thoughts, but I'm very interrupty. Jamie knows this. I'm interrupty only because. No, do I will, interrupt I will, me. I, will, I don't I care. Will, no, because I will, I'll forget my thought. Yeah, And then go I'll be ahead. super bummed that I didn't. You, how old were you when you were diagnosed? 36. Good Lord. And immediately, you know, I kind of went on the, you know, I was on Oprah and stuff and I was all like, oh, I love my boobs and yay, this was such a blessing. And I was so full of shit. Katie, I was so full of shit about how I actually was feeling. And, but I did start a foundation called Right Action for Women, which I think you helped us out with at some point with, with Stand Up to Cancer, which we will get into, yes. of course, because yeah. that accomplishment is like, I'm going to start to cry beyond incredible. And thank you for always, sorry, I'm crying. Thank you for always having me there. Um, but, you know, I started uh, Right Action for Women to get MRIs for women who are of high risk. And like, I was so angry that like young women were not able to get MRIs because of, of insurance, but yeah. I know it is so frustrating. I mean, it, now it's like, it. it's a little bit easier, but at that time it was out of pocket, $3,500 for them I to still get think, it. I still think it's very difficult, you know, for a lot of women yeah. to get, I think you're right. If you have a family history or you're, you know, oh, you yeah, I'm Bronca, gen- but gen- yeah, you know. Bronca or, gen- or other genetic mutation that makes you at higher risk. Sorry, I just got really super. No, that's okay. And I don't have my period anymore. (laughs) Oh, well, that's okay. Listen, it's all of this stuff is really hard. And it's interesting that, that you said your TV appearances after your diagnosis weren't emblematic of how you were actually feeling. And I think, you know, the flip side of this is you know, this people, people coming forward and, and sort of framing their situation in a way that just isn't true or real. Yeah, hashtag warrior. That's, that's something that like Jamie and I are like, so against we're like, no, you know what? It's okay to be super honest about how you're feeling. Cause I think you're going to help more people. If people can relate to that pain. I think yeah. you're right. But yeah, I used to have this fantasy you know, when the 16 or so years that I didn't tell anybody that I had MS, that, oh, one day when I'm better, I'll talk about it. When it's all wrapped up in a beautiful bow and I heal this thing, I'll talk about it. And what I realize now in this exercise of talking about it while I'm still very much in it is this is what people need to hear. People people connect when you're in it. People connect when you're where they're at, there's, and there's such comfort and strength that comes with that. Like you said, Katie, the community. And I feel so bolstered by this MS and messy community. I shouldn't even just label it just MS. Our listeners in this messy community in a way that I have never felt before 
just by being honest and vulnerable. And I attribute Christina to really bringing that out in me in a raw, authentic way that I wasn't able to quite tap into before. That's because I'm so pissed. interesting. I'm pissed off. Yeah. And I think people need to hear you and need to hear that anger and they need to hear that honesty, I think, because, I mean, if you're just sort of a cockeyed optimist and Shirley Temple. Oh, I love that. I'm writing that thing. down. Cockeyed optimist. I'm texting well, myself. That, that's right from now. South Pacific, right? That's right. Okay. Okay. But okay. You guys talk. I'm texting myself. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's just, I don't think it's very useful because it's just a facade, it. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've, I think you've always let us in, into what's happening in your life with the intention of helping people. And that's always been very clear. But when you, what then sparked your wanting to write your memoir? You know, I was at the time, I think I was 64, 65 years old. I'm 67 what? now. No, you're not. I know. She looks like she's. No, 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 no you guys, who actually has the date of the year I was born in my email address, WTF. What is wrong with me? But anyway, <laughs> um, I, think I, I think I had become, you know, I was at a certain age. My daughters are older. They're now 32 and 28. And, you know, I think I have led a very unexpected life. And mm -hmm. it's been fascinating and thrilling and heartbreaking. and you know, I mean, all of the feels as the, the kids used to say. And I sort of thought when you're a public figure and you all know this probably better than anyone, uh, you get written about, right? People project whatever it is onto you. They control the narrative in many ways. And uh, certainly it was true prior to social media when now, you know, now there's disintermediation. You can go straight to people and and you can share what you want to share, not through the prism of somebody who's writing something, who may have an agenda, who has a certain take. And I think for me, uh, the narrative had been controlled by other people. And I thought, you know, I think it's time before I forget everything to tell my own story mm -hmm. and and to kind of share what what it was like to be me during all these years. And, you know, there I've had so many different chapters of my life, um, professional triumphs and disappointments, personal heartache. Um, and, and I've, I've had loss, you know, through my husband and my sister, and then my parents who lived to the age of 90 and 91. So I was very blessed that way. But my sister Emily died of pancreatic cancer just three years after Jay died of colon yeah. cancer. So, you know, I just, I thought if there's, you know, I kind of did it as a gift to my kids because I always thought I'm going to be the kind of mom who writes a letter every year. And when they're 18, give them, give it to them in a pretty box or something. But of course yeah. I never did, but I wanted, I wanted to give it to my daughters, but I also thought, you know, I wanted to be really honest my husband really encouraged me to be super honest. Now he said, maybe you shouldn't have been quite so honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought if there was any aspect of my life that could potentially be instructive for people or fun or entertaining or they could relate to it, I thought, why not? And so that's why I wanted to do that. And I had never written a memoir. I'd written a couple of children's books and I had a book of advice because I gave so many commencement addresses. I, and I'd call people I had interviewed and I'd say, what advice would you give these students? And they would write back really interesting things. And I thought, wow, that would be a really cool book oh, cool. to give people for their graduation. But never had I really written a memoir. And it's interesting that Jamie, you say I let people in because I really did try to have boundaries. You know, I tried to let people in when it would be useful for my information and would help them. But I, I also tried to protect my kids. And when my husband died, I 
really felt like that was his story to tell. I didn't, I didn't want to exploit it mm-hmm. or try to capitalize on it. I just wanted to help people learn what I had learned in that process. So I, I have through my whole life tried to not overshare too much because I think people talking about them as themselves incessantly is, is really tiresome, you know? But what you did so beautifully, my love, my friend, stand up to cancer, what, $700 million? $800 million now. Oh, oh, wow. Well, hello. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Tell that's, us about starting that. That's, 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 wait, can I say something? Yeah. Going to that event um, for the years that I, I was asked by you to come, one time you had, it was so powerful. You had Cheryl Crow, Melissa Etheridge, and myself come out after I had just been, had my first surgery. And it was the three of us coming out, like three survivors. It was like this powerful moment for me, for me. I don't know if anyone- I think it was powerful for everyone. It was like, we are going to be okay. (laughs) And you gave us that. You were telling us that we're going to be okay. You were standing up and saying, I'm going to take care of you. And yes, we lost our, our dear friend during, you know, the process of that. And Laura's but, skin. yeah, but what you have done. And also on a side note, um, on the phones, I would get other people's numbers and prank call them. <laughs> like, like other actors. I would, you would? Just kind of, like George oh, Clooney, no, like Gwyneth Paltrow and people. And I would just walk around and I'd find <laughs> out what their number was. And then I'd, call them and be like, what are you wearing? And no, they, you would, would not. Yes, I would. I would. Really? I mean, of course I would answer the calls too, of course. Yeah. But no, but I also would do that. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> Katie. But I have to entertain myself. Otherwise I get bored. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> I just wanted to take a quick break and share a word from one of Messi's advertisers. Since partnering with Novartis, I have been thinking a lot about when I was diagnosed with relapsing MS. I kept it a secret at first, and that robbed me of the support I really needed. I finally found the courage to open up about it and quickly learn the importance of speaking up. That means making your voice the loudest in the room. You have to find an MS specialist who's the right fit, who makes you feel seen and heard. It's kind of like dating. That's why I partnered with Novartis to create a three-step guide to inspire others to own their RMS journeys, recognize their needs, and find a treatment that works for them. Learn more about my story at reframingms.com. This episode of Messy is brought to you by Lola V. It's an award-winning hair care line founded by the fabulous Jennifer Aniston. And listen, the summer's here, which means humidity's here. How are we gonna keep our hair youthful and fight that frizz? I know with Lola V's lineup of styling all-stars. I use this shampoo. How good does it smell, by the way? Oh my God, it smells so good. And I am, I'm sure people don't realize this, not a natural blonde (laughs) because underneath it's all gray. So it's got that great um, texture to it. And I'm telling you, I've been using it and like I get out and my hair is like lovely. Yes. And you know what my favorite is, is the lightweight hair oil because it, you know, it hydrates, it helps fight the frizz and smooths it, but doesn't weigh it down and doesn't get greasy, which can tend to happen with a lot of those oils. Yeah. I don't want to have to use 5,000 products. No. Because, you know, being people with MS, we do we really want to be standing in there like doing 5,000 things? And the nope. beauty of Lola V is that even if there are supplemental products, For me, like, honestly, just the shampoo and conditioner has changed the game. That's right. So unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolavi.com. And as our loyal listeners, you will get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code MESSY at checkout. That is 15% off of your order at lolavi.com, L-O-L-A-V-I-E.com with promo code MESSY. Please note, you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. But after you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. But you you took a tragedy and and, and literally yep. probably saved millions of people's oh, lives. Yeah. 
Well, Incredible. listen, it was a team effort and uh, there is no I in team or cancer. And basically, you know, I had been really focused on colons and colon cancer and rectums and colorectal cancer. And Lisa Paulson, who was head of the Entertainment Industry Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of Hollywood, you know, she and I were talking and I said, you know, I don't know if you all remember, there was a period of time where they would do these television specials for very important, very worthy causes. For example, after the tsunami and after 9-11 and after all sorts of horrific events. And I said, you know, it's not a competition, but so many people are affected by cancer. We need to really do something about that. You know, every day, every day, I have a friend, oh, I'm going to cry. And I'm telling you this because I want, I want us to hear it because I want this girl to be prayed for. She's 13 years old. She was just diagnosed with a cancer that they said she has maybe six months to live. And she's a friend of my friend's child who I've known the, you know, the friend, but not the girl. And she doesn't even know. She doesn't know the severity of the cancer that she has. And it's like, this was just two nights ago. I was woken up at four o'clock in the morning by my friend who lives in Nashville to tell me, please help, please pray, please help me pray. You know, with like our Reverend Michael and our, our people, like our, everyone yeah. get together. But like, it's affected every single day. There's, your hit. Well, Everyone's every hit. minute a person is diagnosed yes. with cancer and there you go. two out of three men and one out of three women will be diagnosed in their lifetimes. And, you know, it is, it is such a, it is such an evil disease. It can kind of outwit its fiercest foes. You know, they mm. can come up with a medication or some kind of therapeutic approach that can be really effective, but cancer is so wily. It can figure out how to get around so many different treatments. And now they're doing a lot of really exciting stuff with immunotherapy, which is, you know, bolsters your immune system to squash the cancer. But it is painstakingly slow. And, you know, we need to support these scientists. So in addition to doing these televised events, our whole model is collaboration instead of competition. You know, even with worthy causes, with different nonprofits and organizations that pop up to do really worthy, important things, there becomes this competition. Oh, yeah. I saw when groups. I had breast cancer, I saw all the groups like, wow. you can't go to this one if you went to this one. And it's so crazy. I was like, are you not so? Like, but that's the way it wait, is. What? Because I think people become, there's something sort of human nature about their, they become very territorial. And I've seen this time and time again, you girls, I keep saying you guys, time and time again with so many different great philanthropic organizations. So, you know, we said, why can't, you know, if two heads are better than one, aren't 10 heads better than two? Why yes. can't we collaborate? Why can't we share research because one of the things I found when Jay, my husband was sick, is that it was so siloed and 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 it was hard. You know, I would call cancer institute research institutions and academic centers and pharmaceutical companies. And they were all kind of working on their own and they weren't really talking to each other. And at first the scientists were like, we're not doing that. We're not going to share our research and our tissue samples. And then they became so energized by this group approach that some of them even go on vacation together now. So oh. I think we just tried to change the paradigm of how cancer research was done. And I'm very involved with the film that's coming out on Amazon uh, about Brian Wallach and his wife. Okay, I watched family. the trailer yes. today. I'm still emotional about it. I think that's They're, why I'm yes. crying. They are so amazing. Un. Believe tell us, please tell us tell everything. us all about it yeah so his, it's brian wallach and sandra abravea and they met working on the obama campaign they are the nicest cutest smartest coolest couple and i read an article about them in politico and i was involved and still am in project als because my friend jennifer estes who had this um 
theater company called Naked Angels um, yeah. in New York. I don't know if you all knew Jennifer. Uh, I didn't know her, but Naked Angels, I knew. Yes. Yeah. So Jennifer died of ALS and I had become very close to her and her sisters and they've done amazing research. So I was pretty familiar with ALS in general. And I read an article in Politico written by a guy named Sam Stein. And I was so moved by this article. And 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 I called Sam Stein. I DM'd him on Twitter, now X, and I said, Hey Sam, that was such an incredible piece. I and I had read in the article that Brian's roommate at Yale had been following him around for three years. I said, it says they're working on a documentary. I'd love to be helpful in any way I can because I was just so taken by this couple. And so I did it during the pandemic. I did a Zoom with Sandra and Brian. And, you know, we sort of fell in love and we become good friends. And I just am an executive producer. I helped with some of the funding, not a ton. And um, and now Amazon is going to air it. I think starting next month, I believe we're going to the premiere um, in LA uh, next Monday night. But it's um, it's just a very inspiring story. You know, I think people don't know what they'll do or how they'll re- how mm-hmm. they'll react until it mm-hmm. actually happens to them. I don't know how yeah. how I would honestly with the whole no. I mean, host yeah, of things. we talk about like MS, right? And um. What, where, where, where did we think this was going to, you know, like how, where in our minds did this happen? And I know ALS is, I mean, I'm not com- comparing, no, and contrasting, no, no. but I love that in part of it, he wants to help people with, we call it melt, multiple sclerosis. That's what yeah. how we, that's how we pronounce it. You did. But <laughs> like his mission, the fact that he turned it into a mission. It's it, Yes. Freaking beautiful. I cannot wait to watch it. I'm so happy to hear that. For love and life. Yes. For love and life. And the subtitle is No No Ordinary Campaign. No Ordinary Campaign. Uh, Right. You know, I have friends of mine sometimes that will say to me, like, Jamie, I don't know how you do it. Like, I, I, I would never be this way in your situation. And I think it's like what you said, Katie, you just don't know what you would do until you're faced with these things. And, and I am a believer that we are given things for a reason for our growth. And certain of us are given things and uh, that have a platform. And this I don't has, like my reason, Jamie. I don't like I my reason. Know, honey. Well, I this think it's we given talk. Christina I don't a like voice. It. I think Thank it's you. given Christina a voice. Thank you. <laughs> but aside from that, I just, I think that it's, it's so much of who you are and this person, like these stories, like ours and Brian's and yours, they're, they're meant to give perspective. They're meant to give encouragement they're meant to give life and 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 i am so as heartbreaking as it is to watch and to experience myself i wouldn't i truly wouldn't change it as hard as that is for me in some days i as much as it breaks my heart to struggle physically i really don't want to know who i am without without ms And I, and I, not to think that Brian would, you know, wish he had had ALS in his life, but what he's doing with his life because of it will change the course of so many people's lives. And that is, that is a life well lived, you know? And I think that they're really an example of that. And I'm, I'm so excited for people to see that. And um, again, no surprise that you're involved in a project like that. Jamie, why do you always fuck my heart when you talk? <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Katie Kirk. I love you. I just said horrible That's things. okay, Christina Applegate. Okay, just. The reason I, I started talking about this movie about Brian and Sandra is I think for neurodegenerative diseases, mm-hmm. that they would, it would serve them well, the communities and the scientists to me to be more collaborative. Yeah. Because so much of this, I think they they have, you know, listen, I'm not a doctor or scientist, but there are many similarities but among these diseases. 
And I know Brian is really stoked to try to kind of almost model a, a, a whole consortium of scientists after this stand up to cancer idea to work together. You know, I'm very good friends with Michael J. Fox and his wife, Tracy. Mm -hmm. He is one of my personal heroes, but Parkinson's, ALS, MS, Huntington's, all, uh, Alzheimer's, you know, yeah. they all have, um, you know, they, they have on the Venn diagram, there's areas of overlap. And I, I hope that somebody will take the lead and maybe it can be you two to tr or maybe it can be people who are listening in this community to say, how can we make this happen? You know, yeah. life is the art of the possible. And why, why can't we all collaborate? And it, my whole idea was we'll move science forward faster if, if, if we collaborate instead of yeah. compete. But for some reason, it just isn't, it's not the default for a lot of us. We yeah. are competitive and, you know, credit mongery and territorial, you know, it's just human nature. So I hope that, I hope that comes to pass because I do think it would be a really positive development for so Me many too. people. Me too. I, I hope for that for us, you know, for us who are disabled, you know, and, and I know I, I hate saying that word, but it is, it's the truth of kind of where we live and with immunocompromised and neuro stuff. And there has to be something, oh God, I can't wait for the day that people just don't put ego and, and all of that ahead of literally saving people's lives. I just don't get it. it makes no sense to me. And you know, all these different diseases are vying for funding. So it's very tough, you know, but I don't know. I used to give speeches and say, you know, if you can put the entire Encyclopedia Britannica on a tiny little microchip, right? Or, I mean, I just, it's so frustrating. And I think, by the way, I admire and respect scientists and medical researchers more than anyone in the world. And they get very little support or recognition from the general public. So, I don't think it's their fault. I think these diseases are just exceedingly complex, but I really, gosh, I just can't think of a more important cause for than to help people be well and to help figure out how to not only prevent these diseases, but treat these diseases and cure these diseases. I agree. I'm going to, I'm going to like shift a little bit, Jamie, you know, I love to shift. Go, baby, go. Or as we used to say on the Today Show, on a lighter note. I'm shifting only not because I don't want to keep talking about this, but I also want to some nuggets from you. Yes. We had a guest on, and this is something that we do with all of our guests. We just ask about little baby you. And we had a guest on last week who I said, who's little baby you? And she said, I wore saddle shoes. And so I kind of want to know, little baby Katie, hmm. little baby Katie. And when, when was the moment that this became your focus? But little baby Katie is who I wanted, like toddler Katie, what were your shoes? What, what was your street <laughs> like? Like, what did it smell like? Well, what is my stripper name? What's your stripper <laughs> name? No, we don't do that. No, I, I love, I love my stripper oh, name. My, oh, what's your my stripper, stripper name? name is, is, is either so I lived on 40th Street and you can't have 40th oh, Street, snap. but okay. I had, to, but I had two other streets that were perpendicular to 40th Street. So I would be either Pansy Chesterfield oh, or, spicy Woods, or Spicy Woodstock, Woodstock. Oh my God. What's yours, James? I love it. I love your Spicy Woodstock. How could I love you it. compare? Wait, mine's Randy Sutton. Not as sexy as Katie's. Mine's, I, Ra mine's Randy, you had a pet named Randy. I did. I had a dog named Randy, our first dog. I was so Kiki random. Lookout. Oh, well, there that works. It totally works. Kiki Lookout. Kiki Lookout. Kiki Lookout. That works. And what kind of, was it a dog named Kiki or a cat? It was a cat who was eaten by coyotes in the camp. Oh, but anyway. R.I.P. Kiki. Bing, bonk, bonk. <laughs> I had my cats. We only had cats growing up, but um, my first cat was Pansy and Pansy was a black cat. And my second cat, 
was spicy. And I named her after that com uh, commercial. Oh, Mama Mia, that's a spicy meatball. meatball. It was an alpha oh my God. God, yes. <laughs> that's so cute. Anyway, young Katie, sorry. Yeah. We digressed. Uh, I mean, honestly, it's so predictable. I was the youngest of four kids, so I was always smiling. And my sisters and their friends and their boyfriends, I had two older sisters and an older brother, and they would call me Smiley, and I would flirt with the paper boy, Ralph Janoska. I was just a very wow. prototypical youngest child. And I want to know where Ralph is at some point after we... I know. <laughs> I, I loved Ralph Janoska. Wait, Ralphie, I think we called him. Uh. And um, yeah, and I, I guess... I don't know what shoes I wore. I wore... I, I did wear saddle shoes because I was a cheerleader, of course. And back back in the day, cheerleaders wore saddle shoes with their uniforms. Yeah. But what was the moment? Like I, I don't I know it's like a weird thing because people always ask me like when, when you wanted you to become it when you wanted to become, become a pro. <laughs> and I was like, my mom had no money and I had to help pay the rent. So that's how it happened. But I've talked about that at nausea. And you were cute. But like what was it? I mean. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like suddenly I asked Barbara Streisand, I asked Barbara Streisand what a sand, Name drop. sand. Sorry. no, I mean, I interviewed her on my, my talk show and I, I'm also fascinated like by origin stories and what, you know, that movie sliding doors and how mm -hmm. like one decision changes everything. And if you had done something different, the course of your life would be dramatically different. But for me, it wasn't like this epiphany or this aha moment, like, I'm going to be a TV journalist. It was basically, I think it suited who I was and am in that I never met a stranger. I'm extremely outgoing. I love to write. I love words. We used to have to bring a new word to the dinner table every night, a new vocabulary word. My dad would make us do that. Oh, I love and, that. Yeah. And, and basically, I wanted to go into maybe advertising. I wanted to do something creative and fun. and my dad had been in public relations and had also been a newspaper man. He'd written for the Atlanta Constitution and uh, United Press. He was a, a, an editor there. And I think he saw in me something that would align with a career in journalism. So that's really how it happened. And I was lucky and I worked hard. And, you know, during college, I worked at different radio stations and I knew sort of kind of what I wanted to do. And then, and I worked really hard and I saw people succeeding and I had this maybe lack of humility to say, well, what do they have that I don't have? I, I'm just as good as they are. I can be successful even when people told me I was terrible at my job. So I think I, I had this, I was just persistent and thought, you know, I really believe Malcolm Gladwell is right. It takes 10,000 hours to become proficient at something. Yeah. And I just needed to do it more. And I needed to hone my craft, as they say. <laughs> and that's how it happened. And I was very, very fortunate, but I also worked extremely hard. But there, you know, there was kismet involved and all kinds of things. And, and I think there isn't anyone's career, you know, kind of right time, right place. There's so many talented people out there, you all. I mean, so many. One thing social media has, has taught me is, good Lord, there are a lot of incredibly creative, talented people out there. And I think we've all been very lucky for whatever reason. Uh, we, you know, Jamie was on probably the most successful TV show in TV history. And Christina, you know, how long was Married with Children on? I mean, you became sort of a household name and yeah. fixture. And then yeah. Dead to Me was so, so good. So, and you've done a lot of other stuff. You've done Broadway. I remember when you were in Sweet Charity, right? Um, I should have actually looked at your all your CVs before I, I got oh on my, this. But No, you're not supposed to look at our IMDBuzz. That's why I was called <laughs> yeah. the IMDBuzz. It's IMDB. It's, it's all about yeah. you today, Katie. But I was going to say, because earlier it asked you about, yes. you know, the glass ceiling and I was in a movie called Anchorman and. Oh based, my God. I wait, love but Anchorman. I based my I, character I, on Jessica Savage, who was going up in a, in a, a very male dominated world of news and journalism. I and, love that. What, wasn't I, your name Veronica Corningstar? 
you're 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 close enough. Take a sip. Um, <laughs> so another great for, stripper name. But huh, what but is it? it? It was Veronica Cornstone. Veronica, I'm, I'm, you were. I'm just messing with you. But oh no! But Christina, can I tell you? I love that movie right. so much, and I loved you in it. You were so funny. Oh Thank my you, god! But I, I'm bringing this up because I read Golden Girl, which right. was, um, I think, it was Jessica Savage's book, right? Right. And I know I wasn't at the time supposed to say that it was kind of loosely based on her kind of trajectory in that world of men. So I can only imagine what I had asked before is what, how did you just kick that motherfucking door down, girl? <laughs> I to mean, be I, Katie, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. Katie, motherfucking courage. I'm hey sorry. Now. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't really... I'm looking at the name down. of the book because I, I read that book too. And I was so sad. My I'll never forget. My mom came into my bedroom. I was visiting my mom and dad in Arlington, Virginia. And she came in one morning and say, said, Jessica Savage has died. And she I, was so My mom young. did the same thing. That's so wow. crazy. She like, was 36 years old. Yeah, I used to oh watch her on TV every single night. Isn't that crazy? crazy? So young. So young. Um, and that was, and it was much worse for Jessica than it was even for me. You know, Barbara Walters, uh, my friend Susan Page just wrote a book about Barbara, who was really remarkable. And I, when she was on the Today Show, the male anchors had to ask, were, it was required that they ask three questions before she could ask one. And it was just so <gasps> obnoxious. And oh I think, my God. You know, listen, there was still a lot of sexism when I came up the ranks, but it was slowly changing. And I think it's changed even more now. You wonder if it's because so many media outlets, it's been so fragmented. It doesn't really have a place in the culture it once did when Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings and Dan Rather did the news, right? And they were at the epicenter of journalism every single night. Wait, can I do this? Let's do it live. Oh, that's Bill O'Reilly. I know, but I just had to say that. <laughs> We're going live. Well, let's do it live. <laughs> Fuck it. We're doing it live. And that I think that was actually what inspired, that inspired Anchorman. So just you, so you Oh, know. really? Yeah, why. Yeah. Oh my God, right. I had no idea. Anyway, but, yeah. but you see many more women doing well in, in media. I mean- I mean, gosh, it's 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 a struggling industry right now for a whole host of reasons. But, you know, I felt like at the Today Show, um, I was given a lot of opportunities. The executive producer at the time was very young, named Jeff Sucker. He was in his 20s. He gave me lots of opportunities. I think he was a he was a different generation than a lot of the executives who had been there before. You know, it was hard at times, but I also think I had a lot of opportunities. So I don't like to do the woe is me thing. And I think I just love my work. I love mm -hmm. telling stories. I love talking to people. I love learning from people. I love trying to understand this crazy world we're in. I I just, I love... I love people. I sound like you do. Well, you love, you I sound like Kirk Veronica. People. But you carved people. out your voice. You know what I mean? In a panel of that's male dominated, you carved out your space and what your your voice and how you could deliver and no one else could do that. And that's and that comes from like you said, you know, you you always believed why not me? This episode of Messy is brought to you by Maybelline. You all know Maybelline. Maybelline for over a century has provided accessible makeup to give everyone the self-confidence to express themselves. They're the number one makeup brand in the world. And so because of that, Maybelline has a platform and a power to make an impact from the inside out. And they are doing just that. They have created... Now, can I talk to you? Fine, tell them. This is why they have created Brave Together. It's an initiative designed to help those facing anxiety and depression, hello, by funding free professional one-on-one -on -one support so that no one has to struggle alone. Mm -hmm. I needed to tell yeah, people I'm that, I'm so glad Jamie. you did. 
Mental health challenges like anxiety and depression can be so difficult to manage on your own. We have talked about that at length here. You need a friend, you need a professional, whatever it may be. And so Maybelline New York has created the Brave Talk training to help people navigate mental health conversations with their friends. How awesome is that? Christina, tell them. It's the acronym. I'm going to tell you, okay, there's five easy steps to having a Brave Talk. Brave, B-R-A-V-E. Yep. If you can spell brave acronym is be present, right setting, ask questions, validate feelings and encourage action. Mm -hmm. Because it is so brave to ask for help. So let's be brave together. Maybelline's committed to donating $10 million to NGO partners Hello. and providing free access, like Christina said, to one-on-one -on -one professional support to 3 million people by 2025 so that no one has to struggle alone. If you or someone you know is experiencing anxiety or depression, Maybelline New York is funding free confidential support. Text TOGETHER. That's T-O-G-E-T-H-E-R to 741-741 or visit Maybelline.com slash Brave Together to learn more. Messy is supported by Psionic. The Psionic Neural Sleeve is the first FDA cleared bionic clothing designed to help people living with MS and other neurological conditions improve walking and strength. So I have just started my process with the psionic neural sleeve. I sent in a video of how I walk and they are sending me the sleeve. And basically it looks and feels like a garment because it's super sleek and can fit it under clothing, but it's an assistive device. And what does it do, Christina? The system analyzes every step you take and then sends electrical pulses directly to the four major muscle groups of the leg to improve walking in real time. I can't wait to try this. In their first multi-site research study, by the way, 94% of the participants improved their walking. And I know I walking is such an issue for people with MS. And the best part is you pay as you go. So if the neural sleeve isn't working for you, you can cancel at any time. And it's easy and used to customize through the Psionic app, right? Where you meet you face-to-face -face with the Psionic mobility team. They do trainings, check-ins, and they personalize your settings and they track your progress. But will it have me walking like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever? What will I be dream. strutting down the street? I can't wait to watch it. I have a feeling that's going to happen for me when I get mine. Thank Ooh. you. Let's go, baby. We're excited okay. to share that our messy listeners can get $50 off by entering the code messy during checkout. To learn more, visit psionic.com slash messy. That's C-I-O-N-I-C dot com slash messy. You paved a beautiful way. I think people are doing incredible work and there's a lot of great journalism happening now. I think there's also a lot of shitty, terrible, false journalism, manipulated, cherry-picked, uh, distorted information that comes through your feed. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard. It's a very hard environment. But I think for me, if I had to say, not only was it, Jamie, that I thought, why not me? But I also thought, I'm going to be me. I am going to be who I am. Mm. I cannot fake it. I hate pretentious, fakey people. They gross me out. And I was like, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to pretend I'm anyone or anything I'm not. And I made that decision early on. And I remember John Chancellor, he always pronounced it Chancellor, um, wrote me a lovely letter when I was, named the anchor of the Today Show. And he said something like, the camera is the world's best bullshit direct, uh, bullshit detector or BS detector. And basically, I think he was saying, it will come through if you're mm. not being who you are. Like, viewers aren't stupid, you know? Yeah. And they are going to know your essence and who you <laughs> are. He's like laughing at me like, <laughs> are they? Are they not stupid? Well, we can treat them like they're stupid, but they're not, you know? <laughs> you know, you hope you really hope they're not. And yeah, uh, you hope not. And I think there are a lot of really, I think unfortunately, sometimes the people with the loudest voices have the smallest brains. And I think mm -hmm. there are so many smart, thoughtful people out there who understand 
you need to have a nuanced conversation that their issues are complex. It's not an easy sound bite, and you have to sometimes think dialectically, yes, and. And I think in this very tribal black and white world we live in, you know, we feel pushed to take sides and pushed to say one thing or the other, when maybe it's a combination of both. And I don't know, it's 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 a very it's a very fraught time in our in our information ecosystem, I think. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that. Well, what are you tell us about Katie Kirk Media, your slate of projects and all your what you hope your hopes and dreams for it? Well, you know, I think I realized and I I think one thing I am good at at is being prescient, like looking at the world around me and kind of anticipating how things are going to change. And I think vis-a-vis journalism, I realized that, you know, (laughs) people were not watching television at a, you know, a, what is it called? Appointment viewing, right? Right. You all witnessed that in your industry that people were watching things when they wanted to see them. You know, first it was TiVo and then other things. And then of course, streaming took over. And I saw the same thing happening for news. You know, people that you had to really go where people were. And now they're everywhere and there are a million different tributaries that, you know, lead to the collective consciousness. And by the way, oftentimes it doesn't because everybody's creating their own little echo chamber and ecosystem, right? They're all kind of that, that as my friend Nicole says, they're getting affirmation, not information. But anyway, I saw, Mm. I witnessed all these things changing and I thought, gosh, even when I did a syndicated talk show in 20. 11 and 2012, I thought, I kind of feel like I'm riding on the back of a dinosaur. I feel like the world is changing and I'm hanging on to traditional media in a way where this is not where the puck is going. So I went, I did did a syndicated talk show, which really just didn't align with the kind of things I'm interested in, what an afternoon audience really wanted to watch. And I don't blame them. They wanted to watch sort of more fun, lighthearted fare. And for all my, you know, quote unquote, perkiness, I'm actually a pretty serious person. You know, I really care about important issues and I'm really, I really try to learn every day. So anyway, I went to Yahoo to try to, to really cultivate a digital media operation, but they just really, that wasn't, that wasn't really a good fit because I don't think they, they were really there or that wasn't in their DNA. And I thought, boy, I really want to keep working. I love my job. I think I have something to offer. And I said to my husband, why don't we just create our own thing? Because, you know, I came up in the business when you could be a household name. You know, Christina, you said, I can't can't name any male journalists now. And I think it's much harder to penetrate you know, the consciousness for all the reasons I've told Mm -hmm. you, you know, with so many options and this paradox of choice. So I thought, why don't I create something? I can mentor some young people. I can be a job creator. And, um, and, and I've never been an entrepreneur. And I thought, gosh, that would be a really great learning experience. My husband is very smart in business. He was in finance and, um, he said, gosh, I, why don't we work together? If not, I don't think we'll ever, I'll ever see you. So I said, great. And so we created this media company. We have a newsletter called Wake Up Call. We have a very vibrant website. I do a podcast like you all called Next Question. Um, and I, we do, um, I do important interviews. And I think because I've established myself as a you know, a professional who knows what she's doing, a lot of big people will talk to me. You know, Kamala Harris did an interview with me not too long ago. Mike I'm not McFall. familiar with her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Michael McFall, who was the U.S. <laughs> ambassador to Russia. You know, Richard Haas, my friend who's head, on, head of the Council on Foreign Relations. So, and, and a lot of people, because of the name recognition, they're willing to talk to me, which is so nice. And I think yeah. they know that I am, you know, I come prepared and I, I think they trust me honestly. And so I've been able to do that and we want to get more people into the fold. So, you know, I'm not doing everything, 
But we also, our, our financial model, and then I'll stop talking, is working with <laughs> brands that are really Please interested. Please don't stop talking. I'm pretty sure I want you to adopt me. So okay. <laughs> brands, brands that are, you know, as trust in institutions, government, media, all kinds, our institutions has declined. Trust, believe it or not, in companies has increased. If you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, if you look at the Business Roundtable, people are can looking. You, can you stop trying to make me feel dumb? Oh, no, 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 no. But no, I'm, it's kidding, I'm kidding. It's, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. No, that's word, okay. There was a word you said earlier. It was like almost like homunculus, but it was like, homuncul- I don't know what the word was. And I was like, never heard that word. And I, I value <laughs> I myself remember. as really, really smart. It just I, rolls off her tongue. I literally have an etymology dictionary next to my bed because I love words. But you said I something that I've too. never heard it in my life. I was like, what was it? Allison, it started with a C. I was texting Allison, like, what was that word? It was like, come, come, come blah, 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 blah. I don't know. But I it was care. like, I think I need to bring it into my verbiage. I need, I need to take it in. I love words. I love words. Oh, I'm a word. I'm a word nerd. Okay. Like, so can I tell you nerd. a word that, okay, that people always misuse that I misused for a long time? Well, there are, mm-hmm. two, there are a few. Oh, there's so many. I'm sure. Okay. I mean, non- of, of all of us. Nonplussed. What non-plussed. do you think nonplussed means? Nonplussed. It's French. It's en français. It's non plus. What do you think it means, mon chéri? Ma chérie. Um, it means not to be. Um, don't look uh, it up. Don't. Look I'm it not. Up. Not to be messed with. Like you, you're not. Um, you don't know because you're dumb. Because you don't know the word. <laughs> <laughs> that actually. That was a good. That was a good. That's that was the a good definition try. of the word. A good try. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 It's good that, because most people think it means unbothered. No, it's like you're not. You're not in it. Like you don't get it. You're not. It's somebody who's surprised and confused. Yes, that's. Yeah, I know what that word. The other one, the other word um, that bothers me, what the people say is exponentially. And they use it incorrectly, constantly. How do you correctly use it? Well, exponentially is, it's it's almost like a math kind of thing. It's like we're going down here to here with like, um, you know, money or, you know, like in, in government and, and, you know, it's changed exponentially, but you can't say that you went to therapy and you changed exponentially. That's actually not the definition, but I feel like Webster's dictionary has changed it now for this generation that they can uh, apparently use that word, however they want to use it. Well, it says with reference to an increase more and more rapidly, our business has been growing exponentially mathematics by means of or as expressed by a mathematical exponent values distributed exponentially according to a given time constant whatever the hell that means but i know what you mean okay you want okay that's good that's you know what another another one is people say primer instead of primer primer is something you put under a coat of paint primer is like a lesson I've something. never even heard the word primer in my life. You <laughs> have either. No. No? Oh, Neither one girl. of us. I've like, heard oh, primer. Okay, I'm going to start giving you like a word of the day. Oh, please. Wait, I have to show you this, Katie. I guess a primer is what you put on your face before makeup. I was going to say, I, I, I've I put makeup primer on. Right. Too. Prim- well, that's, I'm talking about like, can you give me a primer on what happened in Afghanistan? Right. Oh boy. Uh, primer is a, uh, there's a book. small introductory book on a, t- a subject, a short informative piece of writing. And uh, I'm going to say, Siri, how do you pronounce P-R-I-M-E-R when it's a short informative piece of writing? I pronounce primer, the textbook, to rhyme with trimmer. There you go. Okay, here's my book. It's next to my bed. What is it? Etymology. It, look oh, at this smarty awesome. pants. It's the origin of words. I, I love, love that. I'm going to get that book. Oh, there's there's so many of them. I have like dog-eared. Look at I have dog-eared of words that I love. But I love the etym- etymology of words. It's like their their source of where they came from. And by the way, can I just finish the thought on my our company? Oh my god! Please finish yes. all your thoughts. Yes, you're Katie so, Couric. No, no, I was just going to say. So we work with brands that care about big issues. They they need to. Mm-hmm. They need to care about more than the bottom line. Not only for consumers, but also 
for employees. You know, employees want to work yeah. for a company that they that they feel good about, right? And so we have big brands like Procter and Gamble and Exact Sciences and all these other places who we align with to tell stories about things they care about. Thank you. The I end. love that so I, much. Um, okay, so this okay. this game, Boy. you all you have to do is tell Madam Christina five favorite movies of yours. Don't think about it. This is how she says, don't think about too much about it. Say them. And she's going to be able to basically tell you exactly who you are because of those things. Okay. And they're movies that you could watch over and over and over again. So no thinking five. And I'm going to write them down. On okay. My phones. Something's got to give the Shawshank Redemption. Um, the Sound of Music, hmm. West Side Story, Rear Window. I don't know. Oh, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, the 1938 version with Robert Donna. Well, I didn't see that. Hold on. It's so good. It's so okay. sad. Don't tell me things. Hold on. Okay. You guys talk while I, I meditate on this. Shawshank okay. was one on my list as well. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. Oh, I do too. I do too. Oh, I, I forgot some... Anchor Man. Oh my God, it's done. <laughs> it's done. It's great. So she knows. She's got it. Justice. You want justice for yourself, for your loved ones, for your childhood, for the work that you do. You want justice. It's like, it's, it's really clear. Why? Um, rear window is a man trying to figure out what the heck is going on over there, right? Yeah. You want who justice. murdered the person. Yeah. You want to, you like everything here. I wrote them down. Everything here is about the puzzle of life. The and sound I think of that music. You, yeah. That was, uh, oh, I didn't well, put justice music against on there, the, right. the Nazis, right? The, yeah, yeah. Nazis yeah. and singing and, uh, and singing <laughs> and curtains for clothes. Okay. She wanted justice to whatever. Okay, sorry, I didn't put that one down. Um, Fraulein Maria wanted justice. She did, she, she did. did. And she was the underdog, right, Jamie? Yeah, Absolutely. this is all like an underdog going for what is truth. Mm. It, like, it's so oh, freaking I evident. also it's love so... Scent of a Woman. <sighs> scent of a Woman? Yes. Oh. Oorah. <laughs> yeah. That was, with your cold, that was good. Thank you. <laughs> I, love I do Pacino. think I'm, I'm I, I do, I do one. care about justice and fairness. So I think and that's probably yes. right. Yeah. But maybe from yeah. a kid, if you saw stuff on the, the playground, did you ever see like kids being mean to another kid and you wanted to take care of them? Yes. I don't know. Cause everything you're doing is about someone wanting justice and someone playing chess in life and trying to figure out like, how, how can we make this better for everyone else? I do like, I am very acutely aware of people like if somebody's standing by themselves at a party, I'm sure you guys do this too. Yeah. I always walk up to them yeah. and talk to them. Or I remember there was a girl in my piano uh, group who never got the prize. And I said, Mrs. Richmond, I hope, I hope that, um, gosh, what was her name? Jocelyn or something. I hope she wins the piano pen today. Aww. And, and Aww. Mrs. Richmond gave her the pen. She and I do did. think, I, I, I'm very sensitive when somebody else is hurting, I think. Well, that's, yeah. that's evident yeah. in your movies, but also evident in the incredible mm -hmm. legacy you have given to all of us all over the world with your journalism, your kindness, your brilliance, your mind. Oh, quit it words. some more, Christina. Um, you're good. You have four. Well, I think we have another four hours okay. to finish good this bo podcast. Good, good boobies that are healthy. We yes. know your boobies are healthy and yeah, those things. What hey, a pleasure, Katie. I so I'm so happy. Um, so happy to do this, you guys. And anything I can ever do for you or for the MS community, I want to just say again, thank you for what you're doing to bring people together. I I admire people who I have a friend named Allie who was diagnosed with Parkinson's. I think she's 47 and I met her because we met at the Michael J. Fox walk in Central Park a few weeks ago. And, you know, she is using her platform to help other young women who have Parkinson's. And 
Gosh, isn't it a gift when you can make people feel less alone? I mean, yeah. what is better than that? Honestly, nothing. I don't know. A cure for all our things. We love that yes. too. Yeah, that yes, too. that's Until the only thing better. That's the only thing I wish better. But other than that, thank you always for what you have done for this world. Like, I don't think you re- the world and to for us. And um, we we usually do something where we pull a card. Yes. a spiritual card at the end. And we have never done it with the guest on. We do it after they've left. Oh, but you want me to leave? No. no. We want That's you to stay. That's what I'm stay. saying. We want you to stay. Okay. I'm going to pull my card now. Here we go. The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. I think that says it all. Who said that, Jamie? Is that a quote? Khalil Gibran. Oh, he he wrote a, a very... Because he wrote The Prophet. Yes, exactly. Um, wait, I want to read a quote for you all. Oh, Great. Ooh, this is our first. I love it. There's also a nice quote that um, Michael J. Fox used recently in a speech he gave, and it was part of a letter by Albert Camus since we're doing a lot of French stuff, Christina. And he wrote, in in the middle of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. (gasps) I love that quote. That's beautiful. Okay. But the whole thing, you want me to read the whole thing or should I shut up? No, no, kind of, sort of, yeah. Okay. My dear, in the midst of hate, I found there was within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I found there was within me an invincible smile. In the midst of chaos, I found there was within me an invincible calm. I realized through it all that in the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invincible summer. And that makes me happy. For it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me, there's something stronger, something better pushing right back okay um allison and so allison it is. send that send, and so it is and so it is this show is executive produced by christina applegate jamie lynn siegler and allison bresnick our audio engineer is josh windish if you want to show us some love don't forget to leave the show a rating or review Hi, it's Jamie. Thanks for listening. I just want to let you know, I am a paid spokesperson for Novartis, but this podcast is independent from my collaboration with Novartis.